Hi, it's Katrina. Frozen Pandemics It's looking like if anything will destroy humanity in the next few years, it's going to be a pandemic. And while the world has already learned what happens when a coronavirus is let loose amongst the population, things could be significantly worse. According to scientists who study glacier ice, they have discovered viruses previously unknown to science hidden inside ice from the Tibetan Plateau. In a report by Forbes, researchers say these viruses are about 15,000 years old and have only survived by being trapped in the ice. And as far as the researchers can tell, they are unlike any other viruses that have ever been catalogued in modern times. These discoveries were made by taking ice core samples back in 2015. The cores were collected at high altitudes, around 22,000 feet above sea level. The ice cores contain all kinds of atmospheric accumulation, including microbes and viruses. Because the glaciers here in Tibet formed over thousands of years, they had a lot of time to absorb dust, gases, viruses, and all kinds of other invisible forces in their ice. But it's not time to panic yet. When scientists analyzed the ancient ice, they found the genetic codes of 33 viruses. Only four of them were able to be identified from virus families that we know about today. 28 of them are novel viruses, which we are all very familiar with by now. However, there is no sign yet that these viruses could be deadly, or even that they can survive in our modern environment. But that's not to say another virus accidentally released from a piece of ice can't wipe out all of civilization as we know it. One sound to end them all. Humanity, our planet, and even the entire universe could all be destroyed by one very powerful sound. According to scientists with NASA, the total mass energy of the universe is estimated to be 4.20 times 10 to the 69th power of joules. But according to math, that number is smaller than the energy created by 1100 decibels of sound. When you convert the energy from 1100 decibels directly to mass, it is significantly more than the mass of the universe, 1.113 times 1080 kilograms. And while this may all just be a bunch of science mumbo jumbo in your ears, let me try to break it down. What all of these numbers mean is that a sound of 1100 decibels would create more energy than there is in the universe. It would result in a black hole with its radius being larger than the diameter of the known universe. Imagine a bass so powerful that when the beat dropped, a black hole larger than everything in existence opened up and sucked everything into it. That is exactly what would happen if something ever made a sound of 1100 decibels. Of course, this shocking discovery doesn't impact us too much because it's likely never to happen. The loudest sound ever made was just over 300 decibels. And because the decibel scale goes up in powers of 10, the chances of getting anywhere near even 1000 decibels is extremely unlikely. Weird, right? The last asteroid. NASA has finally launched a very real mission to help us deal with the threat of a killer asteroid wiping out humanity. Just a few weeks ago, NASA launched the Double Asteroid Redirection Test, or DART for short. The mission was launched on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket, due to collide with a small asteroid at the other side of the solar system named Dimorphos. This asteroid isn't a direct threat to our planet, but it is a great test subject for seeing just how well the redirection system works. The whole point behind DART is to hit the asteroid with enough force that it knocks it off its track, redirecting it away from the planet. If it's a success, it means we should be able to destroy a killer asteroid in the future, even one the same size as the one that killed the dinosaurs. Dimorphos is pretty small, about the size of one of the pyramids of Giza. But there are significantly larger asteroids out there. A comet was actually just found in 2021 that proved to be the largest in recorded history. It's about 1,000 times larger than a normal comet, discovered by researchers at the University of Pennsylvania. Its body has a diameter of somewhere between 62 and 124 miles. If this thing were headed straight for our planet, it would be just about enough to rip the Earth in half. The Boiling Star A shocking new discovery has shown just how our planet, along of course with our civilization, 
could be destroyed by our very own boiling star. A large star over 700 times larger than the Sun has been found by astronomers. It's called Pi 1 Gruis, and even though it's way larger than the Sun, it has a very similar mass. The thing is that it's much older, and so even though it started out probably the same size as our great shining star, it's now bloated and dangerous. This is what is known as a red giant, or a dying star. For the first time in history, Astronomers used the European Southern Observatory's very large telescope to observe the surface of a red giant. They discovered that its surface is made up of convective cells, each one 75 million miles across. Just a single one of these convective cells would reach all the way from the Sun to past Venus. That's how huge the star is. The issue is that Pi 1 Gruis ran out of hydrogen to burn and then stopped its nuclear fusion. Basically, it ran out of energy and started to shrink. This caused the star to heat up to over 100 million degrees. The extreme temperature caused the star to fuse helium into heavy atoms like carbon and oxygen. Its intensely hot core then began to push out the outer layers of the star, causing it to balloon hundreds of times larger than what it originally was. Now, the apocalyptic news here is that when this happens to our own sun, we will literally be swallowed by it. The sun will bloat, swallowing Earth into its fiery belly. The coming invasion. More unidentified flying objects have been discovered in the Hudson Valley region than just about anywhere else in the USA. The Hudson Valley is just slightly north of New York City, and it's the UFO capital of the world. In the last decade, there have been over 3,000 extraterrestrial encounters reported. That is a shocking amount of potential alien discoveries. And this isn't a new phenomenon either. Between 1982 and 1986, the Hudson River Valley area saw a massive surge in alien activity. This was shocking because the people who lived here were considered well-educated and well-respected, and thousands of these smart, affluent people saw UFOs or had some kind of contact with aliens. Some nights in the 1980s, calls to 911 about alien visitors became so frequent that the lines continuously got jammed. In any case, some people believe this has all just been a warm-up for an alien invasion. Thousands and thousands of UFOs in the same place could mean that the extraterrestrials are planning to make their touchdown in the Hudson Valley. And if that turns out to be true, Chances are the touchdown won't be a friendly one. They could very well wipe out all of humanity. Slime Mold Takeover Slime Mold could take over the human race. The reason is very simple. Slime Mold is more advanced, more intelligent, and more useful than humans, even though it doesn't actually have a brain. Still, Slime Mold has 720 sexes, it's able to heal itself in under two minutes, even when cut completely in half, and it can remember important things and even solve complicated problems. This is impressive seeing as, like I said before, it doesn't have a brain. It also doesn't have a mouth or any eyes. But here's the deal with slime mold. Scientists don't really know what it is. They used to think it was a kind of fungi, seeing as slime mold is normally found in dark and wet environments like caves. But now, scientists are starting to think a slime mold is more like an amoeba. It's a single-cell creep that moves by pulling itself along with its gross tentacle-like arms. Plasmodial slime molds in particular are quite threatening to humans because they've learned how to do tricks. Scientists at the National Center for Scientific Research in France taught slime mold to enter specific areas that they would normally avoid because the areas would usually be filled with toxic substances. What the scientists found was that the wisdom was passed on to different cells. This means the slime mold learns and adapts even without a brain. If it ever gets to the point where slime mold can grow itself fast enough, it might just cover the whole world and snuff out humanity. Are you afraid of the slime mold takeover? Let me know how you feel about this exceptionally intelligent slime in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. We've got lots more videos coming up. A black hole. A new discovery has shown that a black hole may just destroy our planet and our civilization. And it wouldn't even need to be that big. 
Scientists say that a black hole just one millimeter would rip apart our entire world. That means if there were a black hole small enough to fit on your pinky nail, it could still kill all of humanity. Because, according to Hossam Ali from the University of Leicester, a one millimeter black hole still has a mass that's 10% of our own planets. Its gravitational pull would be so immense that it would cover a third of the world, slowly ripping it apart at about three miles a second. Of course, this is assuming that the tiny black hole appears on the surface of the Earth. If it did, its sphere of influence would literally eat the planet a few seconds at a time until just about nothing was left. The good news is that nobody has figured out how to make their own black hole. If some scientist ever does, they'll probably destroy the Earth. The incoming supervolcano. A new scientific study says we are on the brink of destruction, and it's all thanks to a supervolcano. The research was published in the scientific journal Public Library of Science One. But to understand what the research is talking about, Let's take a closer look at supervolcanoes themselves. The difference between a normal volcano and a supervolcano is that the latter is large enough to wipe out every living thing on Earth. An eruption would be devastating. Scientists say that if one of these volcanoes blew its top, it would be so loud that people would hear it all over the planet. Black rain would fall from the sky, the atmosphere would turn dark from so much volcanic ash, and pretty much all life would die. The only thing more devastating than a supervolcano going off is an asteroid several miles long crashing into the planet. Both of these are nightmare scenarios, but supervolcanoes are scarier because we know that there are several of them in the world, and some of them right next door like the one at Yellowstone National Park. These volcanoes are fueled by impossibly giant magma pools deep beneath the ground. Scientists previously thought that it could take anywhere from 100,000 to 200,000 years for the magma pools to grow big enough to create enough pressure to force an eruption. But the new research is showing that these magma pools may only exist for a few thousand years before they explode. Plus, the reservoir at Yellowstone National Park has been rising at blistering speeds since 2004. What this means is that Yellowstone could literally explode at any second and kill everyone on Earth. Deadly Egyptian Curse When the tomb of the boy king Tutankhamun was discovered in 1922, archaeologists were warned not to open the sarcophagus, lest they wished a terrible curse to haunt them for the rest of their lives. After they opened the sarcophagus of the ancient mummy, many of the archaeologists either died or had pretty miserable lives going forward. Of course, there are probably no sarcophagi that will release a horrible Egyptian curse to wipe out humanity. I mean, it might be possible, but it's pretty unlikely. But microbiologist Raul Rivas believes that it may have actually been fungi that caused the death of some of the people who opened Tutankhamun's tomb. He says a fungus, a species of Aspergillus, could have been living for thousands of years inside the sealed sarcophagus. The spores remained viable for a very long time. When the archaeologists opened the tomb, they unwittingly exposed themselves to the spores, which caused their health to deteriorate and some of them to die. What's really scary is that if researchers were exposed to a particularly voracious and deadly type of fungus like the slime mold, they could theoretically spread it across the world, killing everyone. They just haven't opened the right tomb yet. Collapse of Time and Space The God Particle was discovered by scientists in 2012. At the time, Stephen Hawking said that this particle could potentially destroy the entire universe. The God Particle is known as the Higgs boson, and it shapes and sizes everything that we know of in existence. Now that we have discovered the particle and are learning how to utilize it, we could be opening up a Pandora's box of instability. At the highest energy levels, the Higgs boson particle could cause a catastrophic vacuum decay that would result in the complete collapse of both time and space. It's not clear exactly how researchers could do this. The particle is just so uniquely powerful that it can become wildly unstable at any energy above 100 billion giga electron volts. What this means is that the particle, when exposed to this high energy, could theoretically undergo vacuum decay. The vacuum would expand at the speed of light, 
basically erasing all of time and space until nothing remained of the universe except infinite blackness. And all of this could happen, according to Stephen Hawking himself, right here in some mad scientist lab. Anna Chapman I suppose you could say that being a spy is in Anna Chapman's blood. The beautiful and notorious Russian spy's father was a high-ranking KGB official. After earning her master's degree in economics, she met her ex-husband, British citizen Alex Chapman. They married in 2001, and Anna gained British citizenship. The pair divorced in 2006, and in 2009, she moved to New York City. Anna lived in the financial district, a posh high-end neighborhood that includes Wall Street. She claimed to be the CEO of a company that sold real estate internationally. But as it turned out, she was actually in the US as a spy, commissioned by the Russian government. She was a member of a network of Russian sleeper agents known as the Illegals Program. The Russian Foreign Intelligence Service had tasked the agents with posing as ordinary citizens in search of business contracts that would hopefully lead them to useful intelligence. Unfortunately for Anna, the FBI was one step ahead of the network, and they caught her accepting a fake passport as part of a sting. She pled guilty to conspiracy to act as an agent on behalf of a foreign government and was deported back to Russia in 2010. Britain revoked her citizenship, much to her dismay. Since then, Anna has worked for the Russian government as a model and in show business. Her ex-husband died in 2015 at the young age of 36 but his family insists that there were no suspicious circumstances surrounding the untimely tragedy. In 2017, Anna made international headlines yet again for her Instagram account, which was allegedly chock full of pro-Donald Trump propaganda. Jonathan Pollard Some people would argue that everyone has a price, that even the most morally upstanding individual would commit a huge betrayal for the right amount of money. While there is no saying whether this is a universal truth, it's certainly true in some cases. Take, for example, Jonathan Pollard, a former U.S. Navy intelligence analyst who passed highly classified documents onto Israel during the 1980s. He began sharing top-secret information after meeting Israeli Air Force veteran Avium Sela, who was pursuing a degree at New York University at the time. Pollard volunteered to work as a spy and told Sela that the U.S. military was withholding important information from Israel. He would later use this reasoning as his argument for why he chose to violate the U.S. government's strict confidentiality standards. It's worth noting, however, that Pollard benefited financially from the arrangement. Within the first few days of sharing information with Sela, he received a $10,000 cash payment for his services. He eventually made as $2,500 per month from the Israelis, which was quite a bit of money back then, especially in addition to the salary he received from working for the U.S. government. Pollard also received bonuses in the form of hotel rooms, food, and jewelry stipends. What about you? Is this enough money to start spilling your secrets? Let me know in the comments below. As he eventually learned, all good things come to an end. In 1985, a colleague became suspicious of Pollard's activities and alerted their superiors. An investigation ensued, and supervisors noticed that he was accessing documents that had little or nothing to do with his work duties. The FBI got involved and searched his home, where they found classified documents that were not supposed to be there. Pollard and his wife Anne tried to gain asylum through the Israeli embassy in Washington, D.C., but they were turned away and were left with no choice but to face accountability for their actions. Pollard pleaded guilty to espionage charges and was sentenced to life in prison. He was granted Israeli citizenship in 1995 while he was still incarcerated. In 2015, he was released from federal prison. When Pollard's parole expired in late 2020, he and his wife moved to Israel, where they planned to stay permanently. They received a warm welcome from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu when they arrived to start their new chapter. Mata Hari Margaretha Gertruda McLeod, better known as Mata Hari, was born in the Netherlands in 1876. She was an exotic dancer and courtesan, or high-end escort, who rose to fame based on the backstory that she was of royal Indonesian descent. At the time, it was common for entertainers to present fictitious histories as a way of bolstering their exotic reputation. Mata Hari's career really took off in 1903, after she traveled to Paris and began performing there. 
She became a mistress to a millionaire and enjoyed great success. The controversial dancer was so well known that numerous imitators sprang up throughout the region, hoping to cash in on her lucrative act. During World War I, the Netherlands remained neutral, enabling Matahari to freely cross international borders. She split her time between the Netherlands and France by traveling to and from the countries via Britain and Spain. It was during this time that she met and fell in love with Captain Vadim Maslov, a 23-year-old Russian pilot serving in the French military. He was wounded, and Matahari was told that she could only see her lover if she became a spy for France. She was tasked with seducing Crown Prince Wilhelm of Germany in hopes of gathering vital intelligence. But the prince's involvement in the war effort was minimal, and Matahari failed to procure any useful information about the Germans. She was then accused of spying for Germany, and in 1917, she was executed in France by a firing squad. To this day, many believe that Mata Hari was scapegoated and that her role as a spy was wildly exaggerated. Some even claim that she was innocent altogether and simply wound up in a situation bigger than she could handle. On the other hand, some historians blame her for as many as 50,000 deaths. Aldrich Ames Who better to recruit as a Soviet spy than a CIA agent who speaks Russian and specializes in Russian intelligence? Meet Aldrich Ames, an American-born man who established a solid career with the CIA years before he turned on his employer and his country. The USSR's intelligence agency, famously known as the KGB, was his area of expertise. Ames first started spying for the Soviet Union in 1985. After KGB agents at the USSR Embassy in Washington, D.C. offered him $50,000 for his services. He began passing on confidential CIA and FBI information to a Russian diplomat later that year. Over the following years, the KGB paid him over $2 million to meet with agents and to leave documents at prearranged drop spots throughout Washington, D.C. But as Ames would eventually learn, his illicit fortune would come at a cost. He was finally caught and arrested for espionage in 1994, nearly a decade after he started working for the KGB. His wife, Rosario, was also charged for aiding and abetting his activities. They both pleaded guilty. Aldrich received a life sentence without the possibility of parole, and Rosario was sentenced to 63 months in prison. Cecily Pearl Witherington Cecily Pearl Witherington was known by many names throughout her lifetime, including Genevieve Touzelan and Pearl Cornioli. She was born to British parents in Paris in 1914. In 1940, Cecily and her family escaped from German-occupied France and fled to London. To help France escape from German control, she began smuggling weapons into the country in 1943 as a trained special operations executive courier. Cecily went the extra mile and took control of her superior's troops when he was arrested, leading them in a 14-hour battle against the Nazis. They killed over 1,000 German soldiers and cornered another 18,000 into surrendering. Naturally, the Nazis saw Cecily as a major threat. They offered a 1 million franc bounty in exchange for her death. But much to their dismay, her body was never delivered. She survived the war and lived to the ripe old age of 93. Because she was a woman, Cecily was deemed ineligible to receive the Military Cross Award. Instead, she was offered a prestigious rank in the Member of the Order of the British Empire. She rejected the offer, pointing out that the work she did superseded the standards for a civil medal. She said there was nothing civil about what I did. I didn't sit behind a desk all day. In 2006, shortly before her death, Cecily finally received her well-deserved parachute wings. Perhaps it was worth the wait, as this is a higher honor than any of the awards she was previously considered for. Virginia Hall Virginia Hall was born to a wealthy Baltimore family in 1906. She could have married into her privileged class, but she longed for adventure and a career even after losing her leg in a hunting accident. Hall became an ambulance driver for the French army during World War II. She eventually crossed paths with a British intelligence officer who connected her with training to become a spy in the newly created Special Operations Executive. Posing as a reporter, Hall conducted interviews and gathered intelligence for the agency. She had a very noticeable limp, earning her the nickname the Limping Lady of Lyon. But nevertheless, she evaded the Gestapo's suspicions by playing on their sexist belief that women were incapable of being skilled spies. 
The quick-thinking amputee established reliable connections and used clever disguises to quietly organize a powerful underground resistance movement that smuggled crucial intelligence reports across enemy lines. Hall even managed to break 12 fellow agents out of an internment camp without being captured. As the war intensified and suspicions grew, she fled France, only to return under the Special Operations Branch of the American Office of Strategic Services, or the OSS. Hall proved imperative to the resistance movement, calling in airdrops for fighters who went deep into France and reclaimed territory before the Allies advanced into the region. After the war, she worked for the CIA, never speaking publicly about her critical contributions to the Allied war effort. Her heroic accomplishments have only come under the spotlight in recent years. Anthony Blunt Despite being British-born, Anthony Blunt became a spy for the Soviet Union. Historians believe he may have been recruited as far back as 1934, when he first visited the country. Blunt joined the British Army in 1939, and later on, during World War II, he began working at Windsor Castle, where his superiors were unaware of his Marxist allegiances. Between 1941 and 1945, he provided Soviet intelligence officials with 1,771 documents that were never supposed to fall into their hands. Many people caught on that Blunt was a double agent, long before British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher admitted it to the public in 1979. In fact, some people knew that he was a spy as early as 1950, when some higher-ups at his job learned about but ignored his communist ties. He was so efficient at producing documents that even the Soviets became suspicious, wondering at times if Blunt was in fact a triple agent or playing multiple sides. The fact that a spy had penetrated the heart of the British establishment was certainly embarrassing. He had confessed years before Thatcher's announcement in exchange for immunity from prosecution, but the British government kept this dirty little secret to itself knowing that the public and the media would not be very happy once they found out. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg As the Cold War heated up, paranoia ran increasingly high among both the American populace and the governmental ranks. Anyone suspected of aiding a communist agenda fell under immediate and severe scrutiny. During the early 1950s, the U.S. government accused an American couple named Julius and Ethel Rosenberg of spying for the Soviet Union. While they were both members of the Communist Party, Julius was an engineer and Ethel was an aspiring actress. There was little reason to think that they were involved in any organized efforts to undermine democracy, until Julius's brother-in-law confessed to espionage, implicating him in the process. The evidence against Ethel seemed minimal at best, but both she and Julius were arrested. Officials thought that charging Ethel with espionage would make Julius more likely to confess. But they were wrong. The couple steadfastly maintained their innocence, even when it meant facing the death penalty. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were executed by the electric chair at Sing Sing in 1953, making them the only Americans who were put to death for espionage throughout the entire Cold War. Their sons, Michael and Robert, spent decades advocating for their innocence, claiming that the Rosenbergs were the product of irrational Cold War paranoia. But after the Soviet Union fell, a lot of information revolving around the couple was declassified. It appears as though the U.S. government may have been justified in its suspicions after all. Decoded cables revealed that Julius was a courier and a recruiter for a Soviet spy ring, while Ethel helped recruit her brother into the organization. Nancy Wake Nancy Wake was a New Zealand-born journalist who took a drastic career turn during World War II when she joined the French resistance and helped British soldiers escape from France. Her superior, Vera Atkins, would later recall Wake as a top-notch recruit, stating everything she did, she did well. She started out as a spy trainee and quickly rose through the ranks, eventually becoming the administrative head of around 7,000 fighters. Wake also claimed to have participated in a raid that destroyed the Gestapo's headquarters. The Gestapo sought Wake's capture. In fact, at one point, she became their number one most wanted individual, with a five million bounty being offered on her head. Thankfully, the Germans never got their hands on Wake. She was credited with saving thousands of lives during the war and received the United Kingdom's George Medal for her heroic work. Wake lived in Australia after the war and then returned to Britain in 2001. 
where she remained until her death in 2011 at age 98. Nazca Lines of Mideast Many of us are familiar with the Nazca Lines in Peru, but not a lot of people have heard of the even more mysterious lines located in the Middle East. Stretching from Syria to Saudi Arabia are curious lines etched into the ground, just like the Nazca Lines. However, rather than monsters, animals, or human-like figures, these ancient geoglyphs are in the shape of circles and often resemble primitive wheels. But what's truly fascinating is that they number in the thousands. They are difficult to see, and knowledge of them has been limited since they can only be seen from the air. Pilots reported these strange circular patterns as far back as the 1920s, but now those studying the circular glyphs have used new satellite mapping technologies to allow researchers to take photographs from above. Now researchers are attempting to understand the purpose of these mysterious wheels and who could have carved them into the Earth. First of all, the geoglyphs date back to at least 2,000 years ago. They can be found throughout desert fields and range in size from 82 to 230 feet across. David Kennedy with the University of Western Australia says that in the country of Jordan alone, there are more geoglyphs than there are in all of Peru. Kennedy also says these geoglyphs probably had a useful purpose. Nobody's entirely sure what the wheels were for, but there are other geoglyphs called kites that were used for hunting and killing animals. These were basically stone passages that animals would be funneled through until they hit a bottleneck, at which point they would be more effectively slaughtered. As for who built them, that's a bit more mysterious. Some of these structures are so old they date back to 9,000 years ago. That means it's a bit tough to narrow down exactly which civilization was responsible for building the geoglyphs. Lost Afghanistan For many years, Afghanistan has been one of the most difficult places for archaeologists to investigate. This is a huge loss for everyone, because Afghanistan is one of the most fascinating countries in the world. For thousands of years, empires rose and fell in what is today a hard place to get to, to say the least. But just because archaeologists can't go in and investigate physically doesn't mean they can't still gather information. The U.S. Department of State has actually helped archaeologists analyze data taken from spy satellites during the Cold War. Spy satellites, military drones, and commercial satellite data have been used to offer an unprecedented view of archaeological sites that are too dangerous for people to actually visit. Images have been taken of the walled city of Sar Otar, built back around 2,000 years ago. Archaeologists have also found over 119 buildings from between the 16th and 17th centuries. These were huge mud brick structures that housed hundreds of people in the desert like miniature settlements. There would usually be one of these desert fortresses about every 10 miles or so, or at least a day's journey. They allowed trading caravans to rest in safety instead of having to camp in the desert. Sadly though, it's still almost impossible for archaeologists to get boots on the ground and excavate. For now, all they have are satellite images of over a thousand ancient cities and villages, along with records from archaeologists who have come out of retirement to share the work they were able to accomplish in the past to supplement the aerial images. Saxon Coins and Google Earth A man with a metal detector has been using satellite images from Google Earth to find buried treasure. His name is Peter Welch, and he has been an amateur metal detecting enthusiast for decades. But once he started using Google Earth, his success rate went through the roof. He now uses Google to research farmland so that he doesn't have to just wander around aimlessly looking for treasure. And in December of 2014, he used clues from Google Earth to mark a particular spot that looked intriguing in a local field. When he went there with his metal detector, he found a cache of Saxon coins worth over $1.5 million. It turned into one of the biggest treasure discoveries in British history. But sadly for Peter, he didn't get filthy rich. Instead, the coins were put on display at the Buckinghamshire County Museum. Drone Archaeology in Kansas A recent drone survey in Kansas discovered something peculiar. The drone found a wide ditch overlooking the Walnut River. The ditch appeared to be some kind of earthwork, but it was only really visible when using thermal imaging. According to Jesse Kasana from Dartmouth College, the bizarre earthwork proves that there are still undiscovered archaeological wonders in the Great Plains region. The earthwork is actually part of a cluster of archaeological sites. 
The people who once lived here were the ancient ancestors of the Wichita people. Many years before Kansas was taken over by European cattle ranchers and farmers, there was one great settlement and dozens and dozens of small farming villages. They stretched all along the Walnut River starting around the year 900 and being completely erased around 1650. When the Spanish conquistador Juan de Onate marched through the area in 1601, he described a great settlement in Kansas. But that settlement has never been found, and historians say they aren't even completely sure where it may have been. Archaeologists on the ground have found plenty of evidence of Wichita's ancient people. The remains of pit houses, ceremonial burial mounds, and huge enclosed spaces that were looted by treasure hunters in the 1800s. Because of how badly a lot of these sites were pillaged, we don't know what they were even used for. But now, with thermal imaging, archaeologists are able to map more of the area from above, trying to put together a clearer image of what Kansas looked like 1,500 years ago. Hopefully, they'll be able to find the mysterious Great Settlement that's still missing. Did you know there was such a large ancient civilization living in Kansas? Let me know in the comments below. An Ancient Egyptian Capital Sarah Parkhack is something of a space archaeologist. She uses satellites orbiting way above the Earth to find important clues about what is hiding underneath ancient landscapes. Sarah has made a whole lot of discoveries in her life using satellites, including finds in ancient Rome and from the era of the Vikings. She even won a TED Prize in 2016 worth $1 million for her progress in space archaeology. But Sarah's most remarkable find using satellites was an ancient Egyptian capital, lost for 3,000 years. Sarah is responsible for mapping the lost settlement of Tanis back in 2010. It's one of the biggest archaeological sites anywhere in Egypt. But until Sarah came along, only a small fraction of it had been excavated. Tanis was the capital of Egypt for about 350 years during the Middle Kingdom. But after the year 1785 BC, the capital moved to Thebes, and Tanis was basically abandoned. Sarah took photographs from space to get a better idea of what the city looked like in ancient times. Amazingly, she got an almost perfect map of the capital, including streets, suburbs, buildings, ancient temples, and so much more. Using this map, she was able to analyze the city so that surveyors on the ground knew exactly where to search for artifacts. We now know exactly what the city of Tanis looked like and could even recreate it if given the opportunity, all based on information that came from satellite images. Pretty amazing! Mythical Ireland There's been a lot of interest in recent years of finding unknown archaeological sites in Ireland. Researchers are now using Google Earth to help uncover previously unrecorded sites of interest. This has actually been helped by a recent heat wave. When Ireland experienced one of the worst droughts in years, causing fields of crops to wither and die, the fields were left exposed and bare. When the researchers looked at satellite images during the drought, they found the faint remains of things like ring forts, henges, settlements, and all kinds of other amazing archaeological sites that had never before been seen. This happened in 2018, and it goes to show that in farmlands all across the world, there are thousands of archaeological remains that we simply don't know about. Not until all the crops are gone, and we can actually see the land beneath. One of the first discoveries made was by Anthony Murphy with Mythical Ireland. He discovered an unknown henge near Newgrange that was so impressive it made national news. We don't know what the henge was used for or how old it is, only that the vague remains of it are still around in a random crop field. Have you ever spent time looking into mythical Irish sites or browsed Google Earth images to see if you can spot something yourself? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. We have lots more videos like these coming up. The Movement of a Lost Civilization NASA satellites have exposed lost civilizations that have been missing for 8,000 years. Not only that, but archaeologists were able to use these satellite images to uncover over 14,000 settlements throughout Syria. The small communities, all 14,000 of them, were invisible, hiding beneath the overgrown landscape of the Middle East. It was NASA's shuttle radar topography mission that finally revealed them. Scientists are saying these hidden communities could prove vital in discovering more about the ancient civilizations that once lived in the area. 
We're talking about satellite images of basically all of Syria, a huge patch of land. Traditionally, archaeologists would focus on just one or two major cities. But this time, satellite images were used to look at the whole place. That way they could track ancient patterns of human movement to see what was going on thousands of years ago. What they found were all of the settlements that I told you about. But what's really interesting is that some of the largest cities were not located near any source of water. It's led archaeologists to speculate that irrigation may have been an after-effect of urbanization. In other words, controlling water and irrigation helped some remote cities to develop into larger metropolises even though they had no direct fresh water. This would have cleared out the smaller nearby settlements as people funneled to the safety of the cities. Life in the Amazon While the Amazon rainforest may look today like an inhospitable jungle where no civilization ever lived, that's not actually the case. Archaeologists have used satellite images to prove that there was once an ancient civilization thriving here. It's just that there's no physical evidence left of it today, or at least none that's easy to find, because it's hidden underneath the jungle. But footage from drones and pictures from satellites have revealed a massive settlement from before the Spanish ever arrived in South America, dating back to around the year 1250. And it's not the only one. There have been several settlements discovered along the fringes of the Amazon Rim. They don't look like much more than mounds of earth, but they were once small villages. In total, archaeologists say there were at least one million people living here. Christopher Fisher from Colorado State University told the Wall Street Journal that even though most of South America currently looks like pristine forest, much of it is really more of an abandoned garden. What the archaeologists found in the satellite images were geoglyphs and earthworks. They didn't find the remains of castles or fortifications or physical structures we might imagine. They simply found leftover markings on the ground, where huge buildings had once stood. And when they sent archaeologists to these locations to investigate, they discovered pottery shards, broken pieces of stone from forgotten societies, and possible evidence of fortified settlements. This is exciting because nobody really knows what happened to the lost civilizations of the Amazon. They lived far from major rivers, deep in the interior of the jungle, where nobody had anticipated people could thrive. It's a total conundrum that scientists are still working desperately to solve. Croatian Coastal Mystery Archaeologist Mate Perica was looking at satellite images of the Croatian coastline when he came across something strange. Mate is a professor at the University of Zadar, so he's no stranger to archaeological sites. The images he was looking at seemed to show something unnatural on a shallow area of the seabed near the island of Korkula. He was so interested in the mystery in the satellite photos that he took a colleague to the location and went diving. Mate now believes he has stumbled upon a Neolithic settlement built over 6,000 years ago. It would have been constructed in 4500 BC, at a time when the small piece of land was still connected to the mainland. Now it's completely underwater. What Mate and his colleague found beneath the water proves without a doubt that something man-made was here. They found the remnants of stone walls, which had probably once surrounded the settlement. They also found things like flint knives that had probably been used in everyday life. The discovery has been hailed as a big deal for a few major reasons. First of all, most Neolithic settlements are found in caves. This one was an island settlement. Researchers can't figure out why people 6,000 years ago went through all the trouble of creating their tiny island village instead of hiding out in the safety of a cave. Ancient Alabama The site of a prehistoric village in Alabama may have just been discovered thanks to satellite images. According to researchers, the village is the place where the Spanish conquistador Hernández de Soto fought an epic battle 500 years ago. Historical records from back then prove that there was definitely an epic battle fought somewhere in Alabama, but nobody has been able to discover its location until now. Archaeologist Charles E. Moore used satellite images to look across Mobile County. He was looking for fire-hardened clay. This is because Hernández de Soto allegedly burned the battlefield back in October of 1540. After 200 Spaniards died and 2,500 indigenous people were killed, the site of the battle was scorched. 
And even though this may sound like an obvious victory for the Spanish, the truth is that most of his force was wiped out. He was left with very few soldiers, stuck in enemy territory with who knew how many more people waiting to attack. He then headed west and became the first European to ever see the Mississippi River. On May 21, 1542, De Soto died on the bank of the Mississippi from a fever. As for the battlefield, it hasn't been 100% confirmed as discovered just yet. Archaeologists simply know that they found a large area of fire-hardened clay in Mobile County that could be the right location. And all thanks to satellite images. A tiny black hole. If you ever wonder just how dangerous a black hole is, prepare to be blown away. Astronomers say that a black hole of just one millimeter could completely destroy our entire planet chunk by chunk. As you may know already, black holes are some of the most dangerous things in the universe. A small black hole has roughly the same mass as six of our suns. But even one the size of your fingernail has the strength to rip apart a planet. How incredible is that? Hossam Ali, an astrophysicist from the University of Leicester, says a black hole of one millimeter still has about 10% the mass of the Earth. And because its gravitational pull would be so intense, it would tear apart a third of the planet. It would do it pretty quickly, too, at somewhere around 6 miles per second. The reason a tiny black hole is so destructive is that its gravity is stronger than Earth's own gravity. If it appeared on the surface of the planet, all the nearby matter would bend to the gravity of the black hole instead of the Earth. The entire planet, all life as we know it, would be eradicated in just a handful of seconds. The singularity at the center of the black hole, a single point where gravity is infinite and space and time curve, would swallow everything that we have ever known. Pretty crazy, right? The impossible white hole. Everybody knows about black holes, but almost nobody talks about white holes. A black hole has such immense gravity that it sucks in light, radiation, and anything else that gets close to it. But a white hole is the opposite of a black hole, meaning that it pushes everything away. If you were to fall into a black hole, you would be falling for eternity as time and space stretched all around you. But you would never get to the center of a white hole because all the energy erupting from its center would disintegrate you before you got anywhere close to it. The good news is that according to astrophysicists and astronomers, white holes are pretty impossible. A white hole would have to generate energy seemingly from nothing, which isn't how energy works. Plus, a white hole has never been observed. But what's interesting is that some scientists believe the Big Bang that created the universe was the only white hole in history. It may have spat out time, space, matter, and everything else that formed our universe in a split second. It's just that scientists have never been able to prove the theory. For now, white holes are just a mathematical myth. Ancient Galaxies Astronomers have found two previously undetected galaxies about 29 billion light-years away from us. They've named the galaxies Rebels 12-2 and Rebels 29-2. It took the light from the galaxies 13 billion years to reach us, meaning that they must have formed immediately after the Big Bang. The reason they are so far away is that the continuous expansion of the universe places them at over twice the distance from where they started. The galaxies were spotted by astronomers in Chile using the highly sensitive ALMA radio telescope. And believe it or not, it was a total accident. They were using the telescope to look through thick layers of cosmic dust when they noticed light emitted from the two galaxies. Researcher Pascal Oesch says the galaxies were probably some of the very first ones created. And this is important because he also says that the earliest galaxies formed out of the Big Bang created the building blocks for all the other galaxies that came after. And because the universe is still expanding like a limitless balloon, the galaxies have gone from being 13 billion to 29 billion light years away from us. If this makes your brain hurt, you're not the only one. Even though it may feel like we're sitting still, the universe around us is still ballooning and growing and everything is getting farther apart. Scientists don't believe the universe will ever stop growing. How our bones are forged. A shocking new discovery in space has revealed just how connected we are to the universe. An element called fluoride, 
which is found in our bones and in our teeth, was discovered inside the gas clouds of a galaxy 12 billion light years away from us. The galaxy is called NGP 190387. Catchy, right? It's the most distant detection of this particular element in any galaxy to date, made by the new Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array. If fluoride sounds familiar, that's because we use it every day in the form of fluorine. It's in toothpaste, they give it to you at the dentist, and it's hiding deep inside your bones. But what you probably never stop to consider is that the elements that you use to brush your teeth were created inside of a star. A lot of elements in our everyday life are created inside stars. But scientists are still trying to figure out how a lot of these elements are produced, and by which types of stars. So here's the deal with Galaxy NGP 190387. We are seeing what the galaxy looked like when it was 1.4 billion years old. That's only 10% of its current age, because that just so happens to be how long it took its light to reach our planet. Astronomers are now saying that because stars blow apart the elements that form everything around us inside their cores near the end of their lives, stars that create fluorine probably live and die quite quickly. The team that made the discovery now says that wolf rayet stars, giant celestial objects that live only for a few million years, are probably where fluoride comes from. When the star dies, it blows these elements out into the universe, and over billions of years, they end up being used to build our literal bones. To put it simply, Carl Sagan was right. We are all made up of star stuff. 20 Billion Potential Homes Professor Brian Cox says there are at least 20 billion potential planets out in the universe where life could be thriving. If you've ever wondered about life out in the stars, beyond where we can see, this is the big reveal. Scientists have been struggling for decades to answer the one question. Is life on a planet a common process? Or are the set of circumstances on Earth that led to the development of life so complicated that it's not found anywhere else? It's a profound question with seriously profound consequences. Brian Cox says that there is definitely life in the universe. He says that the laws of physics and chemistry dictate that life must be thriving on other planets. Because the laws of nature are universal, and because the only real requirement for life is liquid water, there is definitely a lot of life out there. In fact, the Hubble telescope has already identified several planets with faint signatures of water vapor. One of the closest is K218b, only 124 light years away from us. And that's only one out of over 20 billion. This means that according to astronomers, there is almost definitely life living on other planets. The big difference is that we're probably not dealing with little green men. We're probably talking about anything from microscopic worms and organisms to marine creatures like fish. What do you think life on another planet could look like? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. The Fastest Orbit In our solar system, Mercury orbits the Sun faster than anyone else. It moves at a blistering speed of 29 miles a second. Its average distance from the star is 36 million miles. In fact, Mercury is so fast that it got its name from the Roman god with wings on his feet. But Mercury isn't the quickest in the universe. It orbits the Sun every 88 days significantly less than our 365 days. If you've ever wondered how fast a planet can orbit the Sun without exploding, listen to this. Astronomers recently discovered a remote solar system 855 light years away from us with a planet that orbits its main star in just 16 hours. It's the shortest orbit ever measured. This planet also happens to be one of the most exotic ever found considering how close it is to the giant ball of fire at the center of its solar system. The planet is called TOI 2109b, but astronomers simply call it ultra-hot Jupiter. The surface temperature of the planet is on average around 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit, but during the planet's daytime, temperatures can get even hotter at about 5,840 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about the same heat as some small stars generate. Trying to walk on the surface of this planet would literally be like trying to walk on the surface of the sun. The oldest quasar It's time to talk about quasars. Quasars are by definition some of the most distant, some of the largest, and some of the brightest objects anywhere in the universe. 
A quasar makes up the core of a galaxy in which a supermassive black hole spins rapidly to eat all the matter that cannot escape its gravitational pull. But while this black hole is eating everything it can, it is also spitting out a huge amount of radiation. All that radiation becomes about a trillion times brighter than the brightest star. The phenomenon is called a quasar. These are the brightest things in the universe. According to astronomer Chiara Mazzucchelli, because quasars are so luminous, they can be seen from very far away. Astronomers have managed to discover the most distant quasar and the farthest ancient source of light ever. The quasar is 13 billion light years away from us, still spewing out light and particles of radiation at ridiculous speeds. It's also ancient, formed only 780 million years after the Big Bang. That point in the life of our universe is what astronomers call the Epoch of Reionization, when the universe was extremely dark. It was almost like a dark age out in space because nothing had existed for very long. All the sources of light that take billions of years to reach our planet, well, they didn't even exist yet. This meant that space was extremely black. If the Earth had existed back then and you had stood on a mountain and looked at the stars, you wouldn't have seen anything but darkness. Gravity eventually collapsed gases into stars and quasars, heat ionized gas, and light beamed out into the universe. This newly discovered quasar, 13 billion years from us, was one of the first to ever become an intergalactic lighthouse, contaminating the Earth. Scientists have warned us of a very strange new threat. As it turns out, spaceships could accidentally bring alien organisms to the surface of our planet which could contaminate it and kill all life. It's an apocalypse-level scenario that's highly unlikely, but still possible. Think about it as similar to when the Europeans arrived in North America for the first time and accidentally brought diseases to the native people that their immune systems were unprepared for. Because these organisms existed in Europe, but not North America, it caused widespread devastation. The same thing could happen to our planet if a mysterious alien organism that we don't know about hitches a ride on a spacecraft and is introduced to something like an ocean. It's not necessarily going to happen, but if you've ever wondered how the world might end, this is one of those ways. Professor Anthony Ricciardi from the McGill University of Montreal recently told Live Science that biological contamination is possible, and because the most plausible form of life outside our planet is microbial, it would basically be undetected when it came back into our atmosphere. The Nuclear Moon NASA wants to install a nuclear power plant on the moon. If you've ever wondered why we haven't started building installations on the moon yet, it's not for a lack of desire to do it. The proposed nuclear power plant would begin construction by 2030. NASA says that having a nuclear power plant on the moon would help sustain future moon missions as well as missions to Mars and to the outskirts of our solar system. But no work on the project has actually started yet. NASA is still looking for partners to help them build their power plant. They say the reactor can only weigh up to 13,200 pounds. It must fit into one of their rockets, and it must provide at least 40 kilowatts of continuous electric power for the next decade. And naturally, it must be designed with moon temperatures in mind. While the moon may look cold from where we are, it can actually get blistering hot. During the day on the moon, the temperature can reach 260 degrees Fahrenheit. That's enough to kill a person instantly. And here I'm going to answer another question for you. If you've ever sat up at night wondering when exactly humans will live permanently on the moon, it's probably going to be pretty soon. NASA is working on their nuclear reactor at the same time as they initiate their Artemis program. This program wants to have a sustainable human population on the moon by 2030. Unknown Rocks Astronomers have discovered some rocks, but these aren't just any ordinary rocks. They are pieces of space junk made up by minerals that scientists have never seen before. In a shocking new study, astronomers looked at 23 white dwarfs. White dwarfs are basically dying stars. What the researchers found was that as these stars died, they ripped apart all the exoplanets orbiting them. The cosmic dust now swirling around the white dwarfs contains rocks from the worlds that were destroyed. But researchers were surprised when they found many of the rocks and elements are unknown. 
But unfortunately, the bizarre new discovery has created more questions than answers. Scientists like to act like they know everything going on out in space, but that's very far from the truth. These rocks turned out to be so different from those known to scientists, from the rocks that make up the planets in our solar system, that they had to give them completely new names. Astronomer Si Yi Chu with the National Optical Infrared Astronomy Research Laboratory in Arizona says the rocks are 100% exotic and that there are no counterparts to them in our solar system. What this really means is that even though astronomers have figured out a lot about our universe, there is still a significant amount out there that they just can't even fathom. Thanks for watching. What's your favorite bizarre fact about space? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe and come back soon for more amazing videos. See you later. Bye.